Hmm? Are you going to get mic'd up or are you going to use the... Uh, I will get mic'd up okay. they tend to wander around. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm pretty loud. I don't think it'll be a problem. Yeah, I'm good. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the session, um, Jay Fonder, who will talk about the accuracy of the NEBA force field in binding free energy simulations to Flores Europe. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, I'd like to also thank the organizers of, of the conference, uh, Kira and Hannah and all the other folks involved. I've done enough of these meetings to know how much work it is and uh, their perseverance through COVID, sending out emails about what was going on and everything has kind of been fantastic. So thanks to them. Um, disclaimers. So I've spent my entire academic career watching dozens of people stand up and put up disclaimer slides about their company, and I swore I would never do such a thing. Well, I did. So um, about, about, about three years ago, five of us who were all academics, all good friends, I've known Ping Yu for 20 plus years, I've known the other guys for 15 or close to it, we started a small company. So it's based in Paris. The stuff I'm going to present today has nothing to do with the company, although, as you'll see, the company is using some of the technology and fancy force fields I'm going to present. Um, it's based in Paris. We're opening an office over in Back Bay. I was over there Tuesday doing deliveries. Um, we have no furniture, but we have a blazingly fast internet connection, which just shows that you have to have your priorities in the right place. Um, so the stuff I'm going to present, these are the folks who have done the work. Roseanne Silva is a Brazilian physicist. She's here at the meeting. Uh, she's finishing up her PhD in computational biophysics with me this summer. Moses Chung is an MD PhD student who is doing a PhD in physics with me in St. Louis. Um, Josh Rackers is a Midwestern physicist trained at Ohio State who got a PhD with me a couple of years ago uh, in computational biophysics. Ji Wong is, a, is everything. He's a, a, a professional CUDA programmer. He got his PhD with me, stayed on as a postdoc, has written the Tinker 9 CUDA code, which all the simulations I'm going to present today were run with that. He, uh, to my chagrin, just left about a month ago, left St. Louis and took a position with ByteDance. As some of you know, ByteDance has set up a drug discovery and design operation in Seattle. Um, Fortunately, they didn't call it TikTok Pharma. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so where are we? So, uh, I'm a force field guy. So, this is going to be something old and something new. Uh, a few of you have seen some of the results I'm going to present. So, I apologize for that. But it is going to be something new because I'm one of the relatively few force field people at what is, appears to essentially be a sampling meeting. So my job here is to remind you that the force fields are important. And I'm going to try and be very straightforward and just I just want to make one or two points. And maybe they'll be controversial, maybe they won't. So force fields are these very strange kinds of things, these classical force fields. They mesh together local valence chemistry, and they match together long range electrostatics and such. As you might gather, a lot of the interesting stuff goes on right in here. That's kind of dirty laundry, and we tend to not talk about that so much. You know, we could talk a lot about how this is going to go in the future. I think ML is probably going to help us a lot over here. We'll find out. I don't think we need it over here. I mean, we know the physics, and it's correct. So um, anyway, so. Long history of force field development. I'm old enough that Frank Westheimer was on my thesis committee. Um, and, and obviously Bill's here who's done everything. I think I've read every paper you ever wrote. It's not very, very close. Um, yeah, so we have, we have uh, force fields that we've developed. So we have an amoeba, a model called amoeba. And so we started on this 25 years ago when I was a, an assistant professor, almost cost me tenure. Because I, I, I decided, I looked around and I decided that we were going to need better force fields in order to get the accuracy you needed to really do drug design. Now, that's, a, that's already a controversial statement for this audience because obviously we can do a lot of things. Part of the reason that we can do a lot of things is with this huge cancellation of error. 
that's going on in the calculations, right? I, I, everybody knows that, but I don't know if everybody knows actually how bad it is. It's really, there's a lot of cancellation of error going on. So we decided we wanted a better force field model, and in order to do that, you need a better description of electrostatics. So we came up with this model that is polarizable and has multiple moments on each atom, and we decided you need that to describe certain aspects of chemistry. Uh, like pi cation interactions, uh, even directionality of hydrogen bonding. This is stuff I've been talking to the community about for 20 years. So we, we built this model. It's kind of slow. It was very slow in the day. And it was like the old baseball movie Field of Dreams, you know, kind of the idea that if we build it, they will come. So we built it, and maybe now we'll see if people want to use it. So we have models for water, ions, proteins, nucleic acids. We have a sort of a GAF, uh, lig pargen, CJNFF, automated parameterization engine called Poltype. That's, and all this is up on, on GitHub. We have a GitHub uh, organization, Tinker Tools uh, organization on GitHub. And so you, you can find various of the things there. This is not quite as simple as some of the simple force fields. This actually does serious quantum calculations. You have to have Gaussian or Psi 4 underneath it. And you know, you're not going to run it on 5,000 molecules overnight. It actually does some serious quantum to get the electrostatics and such. We are, so this is our current model. The results I'm going to present were done with this model. We're working on better models. So Rose, who's here in the audience, is working on the next generation, which is not in production yet. She's parameterizing it kind of as we speak back in St. Louis on our cluster. And it's called HIPPO. And that's a hippopotamus inside a hydrogen atom, in case you're wondering. And um, so the big advantage is it uses the actual atomic multipoles that we already had as a model electron density. So you can devise a model electron density out of the multipole model, and then we use that for things. We developed a repulsion model based on that. It's sort of a, a classical version of Pauli repulsion. We actually got a paper into J. Kim Fizz with that in the title, classical Pauli repulsion. You know, I'm amazed they let that go through as a title, but they did. And um, so, you know, you can use that multipole model to develop an entire force field from the rigorous physics around that. And we're trying to do that. For the purposes of this audience, I would say the biggest advance is it includes charge penetration for the multipole terms, which is kind of a big deal. And as a result of that, you have to reparameterize everything else. So I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So we have a variety of models running around. I'm going to show you some free energy results. So we use dead simple technology for the sampling, right? We do um, a double decoupling, you know, it's absolutely standard stuff that everybody in this room probably already knows. We have to play a few games because of the the potentials we use, our model, the amoeba model, doesn't have Leonard Jones. It has a, a buffered 14.7 potential that goes back into the 90s with Tom Halgren and folks. And so you have to soft core that. And so there are some games you play. But basically, it's dead simple stuff. We do plain old bar, generally, windowed bar. Very simple sampling technology. We're force field people. OK, so double decoupling. Everybody knows how that goes. You compute your binding leg, your solvation leg. You've got a restraint to keep the ligand around. Uh, you take the difference between those two, and you get what at least the field calls an absolute binding free energy, right? One person's absolute is another person's relative. We're, we're big on, on absolute binding energies. We think that's probably going to be an important thing in the future. It's obviously much more general. It lets you look at some issues like selectivity and some other things. Uh, we can also do relatives, but we've tried uh, very hard to push the absolute binding free energy stuff, which I think a lot of people are kind of starting to come around to. OK, so here was our first toy example. This is a host gas system. So I'm going to present some sample results. And so this is what a lot of people in the audience will have seen. This is pre-sample. This is a, a, a host out here called cucubitural. It's a uh, polymer of uh, glyoxal and urea and stuff, and it makes this barrel-like structure. It's got urea-like carbonyls around the top and the bottom over here, and then it's kind of hydrophobic through the middle. And this is bound to a diamantyl system with a, sorry, that's so small. There's a trimethyl ammonium at both the top and the bottom. So the, the, the ligand, the, the gas in the middle uh, is Die charge. It's a dication. Okay. And so this thing is a perfect fit. All it does is it just bobs up and down. 
in the cucubitural, right? So, um, you know, if we can't get that right, uh, the sampling should be simple. This is a test of the force field. This is the tightest known, I believe at the time it was published was, I believe still is the tightest known host gas system. The, the binding, the, you know, there are two experimental estimates. One's 23.7, one's 24.4. You have to, that's hard to do. You have to chain experiments together because you can't measure anything. It's 24 kilocalories in one experiment. So you got to chain experiments together. The best estimate is probably the 24 numbers thought to be a little better. Uh, that's tighter than biotin stripped avidin, okay? So we thought this is simple for sampling. We want to test our force field. We set it up in a box of water. They've done this with essentially no salt. If you add salt, 50 millimolar salt, the binding drops three kcals. So you run it with no salt. We ran somewhere between five and 10 microseconds total on this simple little system to make sure we had absolutely converged it. Our error bars, when you sum up over all the windows, it's well under 0.1 kcals. We got 24.26, okay, which is dead on with the experimental number, okay? So that's proof of concept. So we said, okay, that worked. Uh, let's go try and do some other things. So we've entered sample competitions. David Mowgli's here in the audience. We entered host guest competitions for sample seven and sample eight uh, uh, amongst the, the systems that were considered in sample seven and sample eight were these so-called octa acid systems worked on by Bruce Gibb at Tulane. Um, very nice gentleman. I went down there to visit his lab at one point. My daughter went to school there. And, and so he has a bunch of these slightly different hosts and they bind various gas. They bind carboxylates, ammonium ions, what have you. These hosts have eight, uh, excuse me, eight charges on them. So eight carboxylates. And it's thought that in solution at nominal pH uh, that they're actually entirely deprotonated. So this thing, in fact, is net minus eight. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of charge in a small space. Okay, so while these are host gas systems and probably a bunch of you in the audience are thinking, well, gee, that, that's not a sampling problem. No, but it's a test for the force field. Okay, because that's a, that's a big electrostatic problem. And you know how much and how the water is doing inside that thing when you when you don't have a, a guest in there, you know, that's all very tricky stuff. Okay, so that's the system for sample seven, two different hosts binding to each of eight different molecules. So that's 16 calculations. Sample eight, there were two slightly different octa acids. So this time we've got our groups up here. And by the time you get to ethyl, you're kind of occluding the cavity up there on top. So that's now the test because the ethyl groups rotate, they kind of occlude the cavity, the, the, the guest is trying to figure out what to do relative to the ethyl groups and so on and so forth. So we've got two different hosts, we've got five guests now, that's 10 calculations. So we got a total of 26 calculations. Okay, so here are some results. Oh, well, first let's look at the system. So here it is, we parameterized both the host and the guest with our standard technology. No, no fun and games, nothing, except right here. So there's this diphenyl ether linkage, okay? And so this is a warning. The rotation about those CO bonds is coupled, okay? That's not unexpected. There's lone pair density on that oxygen, and you've got phenyl rings there with pi systems, right? So the rotation about those two bonds is coupled. You're not going to get that right with single 1D torsions. You can't do it. Okay, so we put in a, a, a torsion torsion coupling term to describe that correctly. And I think that's probably necessary because those rotations are controlling the flexibility at the upper end of the cavity, how flexible it is, how much that thing breathes. Okay, depending on what those diphenyl ether torsions are, it can either be kind of open or it can kind of squash in and then we'll favor binding smaller guests. So that's the only trick we played in the parameterization. Okay, so here are some results, and I blatantly stole this from Mike Schneiders, who's sitting over here, uh, because I've learned doing this for a long time that you don't make friends going around beating up on other people's force fields. So we've anonymized this. So this is force field one, okay? This was some of the submissions to sample. This is a well-known force field. Everybody in the audience is familiar with it. It's force field one. And, and so force field one, was run by two different groups with exactly the same parameters, okay? One of the sampling methods that one group used was an alchemical method. 
The other group used what I'll call a pulling method. They were very different sampling methods to get the free energy. And look what happened. They get essentially very similar results for each gas. So M3 is a gas, E1 is a gas host system, you know. And so they're very similar results, even though they're kind of scattered all over the board. So what does that tell you? That tells you that it's not the sampling. The two very different sampling methods were giving very similar results. It's the force field. Okay? That's my claim. Here's force field two. These were done by the same group with the same parameters. And I should note that both of them were using tip 3P water. So two months from now is the 40th anniversary of tip 3P water. <laughs> Bill needs to go out and get a good dinner and a bottle of champagne. And, and um, so they were both using tip 3P water and the same thing happens. Okay, again, one sampling method is alchemical and one is pulling. Okay, and they're, you know, pretty close. So it's not the sampling. This is easy to sample. It's the force field, okay? There's what we got, okay? Now this is not just sample eight, this is sample seven and sample eight. These were blind prospective calculations and they're absolute free energies, okay? Um, we do quite well down here uh, we have a little trouble with the very weak binders. So I called Bruce Gibb. He quotes two of them just as weak or not bound. He doesn't know that. When I talk to him, he readily admits that all he knows is they're less than about one and a half kcals. So I plotted those experimentally as zero, but he, he doesn't know that. And in fact, he, you know, he said they may in fact just be very weak binders. It's hard to do the weak binders. It's hard to do them experimentally, and it's hard to do them computationally, right? Because they're moving around more. So the tighter binders, we do quite well. If you, the, the, right up here, those are basically millimolar binders and weaker. And so if you throw those out, the, um, the, the I'm gonna get the wrong term here, doing this off the top of my head. The, the mean error, the mean, not the RMS, the mean error, um, signed error, um, ah, unsigned error, um, for the guys down here is, is less than um, two thirds of a kilocalorie. It's like 0.63 or something, kcals, okay? So um, we think that's pretty good. So can you do proteins? So here's one that a lot of people are familiar with. The Biggin group published this, at least it's famous in my lab. I think it may be famous everywhere. This, this study on BRD4 a number of years ago, there are a bunch of different crystal structures of a bunch of ligands. That's a benzotriazepine bound. There were 11 or 12 ligands in the test set and there are crystal structures for all but one of them, right? And so we ran those and there are the ligands. The only one, as you'll see in a minute, the only one that makes me a little nervous is number eight, which is ironic because that's Xanax. <laughs> and, uh, and there are the results that we got. Actually, eight's not so bad. Um, and so that's not particularly better than the Biggin group got. It's comparable. In fact, statistically, it's a tiny bit worse, okay? But it's pretty close. Um, and we've done a bunch of other systems. Okay, it was a, a talk yesterday about how there's a better, a need for better nucleic acid force fields, and indeed, so we think there is. So we spent a lot of time developing, uh, Pingu Ran and I, uh, my close collaborator for two decades plus, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, working out an amoeba force field for nucleic acids, and this paper is part of the motivation for that. This is a paper from Tom Cheatham's lab, Christina Berganzo uh, is the lead author on it. And they looked at some simple systems, including this um, tetraloop structure that you see up here. And they ran this to death. And I don't remember off the top of my head. It was, it was a, a replica exchange, and they ran it forever. And in order to, to try to converge the sampling and see if these variants of the amber force field actually did the right kind of thing. The correct structure is five. Okay, and so none of these amber force field variants, the, the Chen Garcia modification, you, you get the right structure about 10% of the time, the rest of them are, are close to zero. Okay, you're just getting the wrong structure. And, and so that's an issue. 
And other people have seen things not too unlike that in other systems, but this is a well-documented sample to death example. Okay, so we developed this uh, nucleic acid force field. These are very, these are average structures in green, consensus structures, uh, compared to experiment from very long, roughly, they've been run out of, not when the paper was originally published, but they were eventually run out beyond nanosecond, uh, average structures. And they're pretty much spot on for these different uh, little unique uh, kinky RNA structures that we looked at. So with that in mind, uh, oh, and here's one other thing. So that's the amoeba force field. We know, so the amoeba force field is not, is not perfect. <laughs> and, and we know there's a charge penetration effect in the nucleic acids to do with the base stacking. And so, so there's this um, uh, sort of tilt parameter here and charm, amber, uh, original amoeba, they all have these big errors in the tilt parameter. As you do the tilt motion over here, this motion down here, you get the wrong energy curve. When you tilt to various degrees with all of, the, uh, all of these models that don't include charge penetration, you pretty much get a flat line, including amoeba. And so that charge penetration term that I mentioned that's going into hippo is a big deal because when you put that in, you nail the quantum result. So, you know, there are still places to improve things. Um, lots of places. Okay, so the system, the test system we looked at here is a G quadruplex. We chose the Terra RNA G quadruplex. Some of you in the audience may know a fair amount about G quadruplexes. I'm sure much more than I do, actually. And so this is a nice one, however, because it's stable in the absence of ions. Uh, and it also doesn't, it's not flexional between different conformational states. A lot of the G quadruplexes are shifting back and forth between very distinct multiple conformational states. This thing pretty much sits here, whether ions are bound or not. Okay, so it binds two ions here in the center, nominally potassiums in vivo, uh, although it binds a lot of other ions. Here you can see a view from the top. We'll call this site A. We're looking down on the top. And then when you look up from the bottom, that's site B. That's where the, the ions bind in the crystal structure for potassium. What we've found is that ions can also bind in the base pair plane here, small ones like lithium. And then some of them bind up here above that upper plane, what we call the A prime site, and some bind down here in the B prime site. And this is something we've discovered from the simulations. There's a little bit of evidence in the literature we may be right about that. There's a PNAS paper that's very seductive that makes us think we may be on the right track here, but we don't really know. It's kind of a, kind of a proposal. So we've run this for a long time. It's perfectly stable. Um, and Here's the time course of ions. So if you set up, because the, the Terra G quadruplex on its own is stable, so you set it up in solution with 150 millimolar potassium chloride, and the first ion binds almost immediately. And then the second ion binds out here, and we've done this multiple times. It binds out here at something beyond 100 nanoseconds out to maybe two or 300, somewhere in that range. The second ion will pop in and bind. And I have a quick movie. I'll just show you the first few seconds of it because it's, you know, these things are kind of kind of boring. I always tell the people in my lab they need to look at the at the trajectories, right? I'm sure a lot of people have told people that they need to look at the trajectories, but they are kind of boring sometimes. You need a lot of popcorn. Um, yeah, so the, the ions that are going to bind are these guys I've colored orange. They're all the same. There's one back here. It's actually not bound. It's back behind. And the other one's, I think, hiding over here. And so when I turn this on, you're going to see that one of them binds almost instantly. And then the other one's going to come in slightly later. Okay, so one's bound up there. And the other one's going to, okay, now the other one's bound. And this is going to go on forever. Okay, so that happened in the first 120 nanoseconds of a two microsecond simulation. So I won't make you watch the rest of it. Now you're going to need the popcorn. Um, okay, so why would we want to do this? Well, what we want to do is we want to see how different ions behave, right? And so we've looked at the binding of all the um, alkali metals and the alkaline earths. Uh, we're gearing up to do things like mercury. These, these things uh, bind mercury ions very tightly, actually. 
Um, so here's what we get. This is the free energy, the absolute binding free energy for the first ion, and then the second ion. So lithium only binds one. These are all in kcals. So lithium only binds one. It won't bind the second one. And that's kind of known. In fact, a lot of people uh, are able to denature other G quadruplexes by adding lithium salts. That's, that's something you often do. Uh, potassium binds the best. Sodium is very close experimentally. So this is a, an experimental plot over here. This is not, these bars are not proportional to binding free energies. This is a, a change in a CD spectrum. It's some indication of what's binding better than the other thing, but they're not binding free energies. Um, but, you know, potassium and sodium are good. And then, and then you go down as you go to rubidium and cesium. We see exactly the same result. We know where they bind. The, the um, alkali metals bind canonically at the A and B sites, like you saw in the crystal structure. The, the alkaline earths are interesting. Magnesium doesn't bind, um, will not bind. And that's just because its solvation free energy is, is too negative. These are high ion hydration free energies, and we nail these in water. We have every ion hydration free energy without working at it hard within one kcal per mole. So the ion hydration free energies are spot on, and then we're computing absolutes. Magnesium doesn't bind, calcium is weak, and then strontium and barium are both moderately good, but they're not as good as potassium and sodium. And they bind in odd places. They bind the first ion in B prime or A prime, and then the other one over here. That's the preferential binding mode because you don't want two dications in the canonical A and B sites. There's just too much electrostatic repulsion between those dications when they're that close together. They're actually quite close. So when you get the dications in there, then they shift to these alternate positions. That's our hypothesis. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Reality check. So I've been giving talks like this for a long time, right? So the 2023 version of the complaint about somebody that's got a fancy force field would go something like this. They, you'd say, okay, maybe the force field is, is accurate. Okay, I'll grant you that maybe, uh, but it's still too slow, right? It's actually not that slow. We could, I'd be happy to talk to anybody that wants about that. In any way, we've got a huge sampling problem, right? And that's what we've heard about at the meeting. Everybody's got a bad sampling problem. But I could argue you want to get the force field right first. You know, you'd, you'd like to deconvolute those problems. Um, and then besides, you know, the, 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 the flavor of the year now is that the future is machine learning models. And, and I could have some interesting discussions with people there too, if you want. Uh, you know, obviously machine learning is very powerful. I'm not convinced we need to relearn basic physics that we already know. And I'm not sure the machine learning models are gonna end up being faster. There's, there's something akin to the uh, conservation of difficulty, right? Because the reason chemistry is hard Michael Schertz made the point we should look at distributions instead of energies, and that's fine. But the problem with chemistry is chemistry is very simple, but small energy differences matter, right? And so that's bad for machine learning models because you're going to need a lot of data to get the precision you need. You're either going to need a lot of data or you're going to need a lot of storage. It's the classic computational trade-off. And I don't know why we need to relearn physics, but that's just me. So maybe that's controversial enough and somebody will come talk to me. None. Okay. Yeah, they're they're done right. So they're done at oh sure, we do it with periodic boundaries, but they're done in big boxes. The, the, the experiments are done very dilute at extremely low ion concentrations. I didn't mention, but we've also done uh, ion concentration on those host gas, the octa acids up to one molar sodium chloride, the binding is actually tighter. And that's experimentally known. And we're able to reproduce that. We increase the salt concentration. When you go up to one molar, a lot of the tighter binders bind about one kcal tighter. And that agrees with experiment.
Sounds good. Thank <laughs> you.